Okay. And I'm going to share my screen. Let's see here. We put together a few slides just to keep us um, kind of grounded. Can everyone see that? Okay. I'm not going to do it in present uh -huh. mode because it's harder okay. for me. Okay. Um, my name is Rebecca Vlasheen and I am, um, I use the pronouns she, her, and my feet are touching right now in Boulder, Colorado, up in the mountains. The weather here is beautiful and sunny. It's about 57 degrees. And I am here presenting with, uh, and not really presenting, but opening up space for some dialogue with uh, colleagues of mine. And I'll pass it on to Sina Harjo. Hi, I am Sina Harjo. Um, I, uh, will you go to the next page? Because oh. I definitely need the cue of the prompts. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry about it's that. A, yep. It's a Friday morning. <laughs> Um, so we just thought that we wanted to introduce ourselves with some same prompts here. And so now that we're on this prompt screen, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am Seminole, Choctaw, and Creek, which are three Native American tribes from um, Oklahoma. My feet are touching the ground here in Lakewood, Colorado. It is a bright, sunny day. I don't know if you could see the sun behind me. Um, and... Um, I'm just really excited to be here and to have some dialogue and a conversation. Hey, good morning. And Robert, it's yours. Oh, yeah, thank you so much, Sina. Uh, my name is Robert McMullen, and uh, I, am, I go by his, he, and him for my pronouns. My feet currently are touching the ground here in the Mile High City of Denver, Colorado, at my workplace, Children's Museum of Denver and Marsco campus. And the weather today is absolutely splendid. As you can see, just kind of a look outside that's actually overlooking our parking lot here at the museum. And I'm just really happy to be here today with you all. So we are hoping that Sally and Judith, you would be able to also introduce yourselves in whatever way you feel comfortable. So Judith, feel free chatting this if you'd like um, and using these prompts. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, I use she, her, and hers, and my feet are touching down on Treaty 7 territory in Calgary. Um, I can't name all of the um, groups and tribes by name without my, um, you know, list in front of me, but I'm very appreciative to be on this uh, land and working and living and playing and loving. Um, I'm having the northernmost version of your weather, uh, so just a few degrees cooler, and lately we have been treated to and searching out the northern lights, and I hear people are seeing them, and I'm not seeing them, or I'm only seeing them faintly, so anyways, that's, that's kind of the latest thing here. Oh, wow, how exciting. Uh, awesome. Okay, did Judith, did you, I'm trying to pull up my chat here. Oopsie. Okay. Mm. Oh, awesome. So great that you are here with us from North Wales. That's exciting too. Yes, awesome. it is. And that you're in a library. I adore libraries and we have this, you know, informal learning connection with Robert in the museum and you in the library. So that's yeah. a really a, a great space to be coming to us from. Okay, so we'll look at slide three here, uh, just kind of grounding us in the purpose of what we prepared today. It's really uh, an opportunity for us to share with you and to have some dialogue around how we have tried um, the three of us through our roles and our work in a collaborative uh, certificate, leadership certificate program to open up spaces that are more democratic, that are really addressing uh, an active way of hopefully decolonizing our higher education spaces. And this image that you see is represents our little circle of students that, that we walk with each year in our certificate program and um, kind of the space, the circle we try to hold with them. And some of the ways that we're elevating um, experiences that we think are supporting more liberatory education experiences. And those include critical dialogue, sharing of artifacts, 
actually creating things with one another and sharing them and then actively engaging in storytelling. We're, as you can tell, we're kind of grounded in a social constructivist pedagogy in this certificate program. And I'll talk a bit more about the specifics of that, but we're hoping to um, share our journey of studying our use of some of these pedagogical tools and different ways that students can represent and make meaning together. Um, slide four gives you a sense of our program. The name of the program that we're all, each, all three of us are a part of is called the Buell Early Childhood Leadership Program. And it's focused on early childhood professionals across the state of Colorado. And this map kind of gives you a sense of where all of our students are. Each year, it's only, it's like between 18 and 22 students who join the cohort. It's fully funded by um, a generous philanthropic partner, the Buell Foundation. Um, and it's delivered in a partnership model between the CU Denver and a community partner, Clayton Early Learning, which is actually where uh, Sina Harjo uh, finds herself right now. She's also a doctoral student at CU Denver, so she crosses many of these. But um, we come together collectively to design six graduate level courses that end in an 18 credit certificate that um, supports change efforts in early childhood in our state. So we're actively talking about equity and policy and advocacy um, related to the field of early childhood in Colorado. And you might not tell it from this map, but our state is incredibly diverse. And so there's lots of different cultural and historical um, ways of knowing and being in our state and the historical kinds of contexts that, that created those spaces are diverse and rich. Uh, we also have uh, different languages represented across our state. And so when we're coming together as a group of 20, the selection process is intentionally designed to really create a very diverse group of students entering the program. And not just in terms of their ethnic diversity, um, but also their other identities, including age, language, uh, gender expansive status, LGBTQ status, and they start with um, an equity course. And that equity course, this leading within, is the beginning of our experience together in this one year long program. Is um, one of the courses is leadership for equity. And that's where Sina and Robert and I really um, came together for the first time. And part of that experience is designing a summer equity, I mean, an equity artifact. And so we're gonna talk today about our study of that equity artifact that was created by students. In the fall, we move into some other courses that are listed there under leading with others. And we do another kind of creative storytelling expressive experience that's an Ignite presentation. So we also studied that as we were looking at um, those experiences and trying to understand their meaning. Then in the spring, the leading across semester, which is typically when students are getting really into action focused work in their communities, um, we brought all of the, after we did some analysis, we brought folks together again in the spring to enrich the data through a participatory, participatory process. So that's what we're gonna talk to you about today. And we're hopefully gonna engage you in some of the practices that we use in our courses. So when we um, started this conversation in the equity course in the summer in this program, um, when we think about how this connects to the title of this conference with the decolonizing of the learning spaces and figuring out other ways to sort of create a learning experience that touches people on multiple levels. So we're really looking to expand maybe more than just the um, print and the page and academic view of what we're talking about because we're really trying to think of a whole program and a holistic approach to looking at how people are engaging with each other in all kinds of learning environments. When we're looking at our early child environments, it's really important that we're starting with a good strong um, base that is high quality, that's diverse, and that recognizes um, 
trauma and making sure that they have positive learning experiences. And in order to do that, we as adults, as the providers of these experience needs to be able to um, really be in touch about our own experiences that we've had um, with education, with living, with surviving, and with and being able to make it to um, this part where we can provide these learning experiences. One way that we start with these um, learning opportunities is by providing um, strong books like the mannequin book that was on the last slide. Um, I apologize, my four-year-old is here. It's, an, it's a school off day. And so I'm gonna let him have a, a picture on the screen and then I'm gonna send him out of the room. Um, say hi. 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 <laughs> Okay, well, here we go. So we work with young children. And so this is part of it. And so um, we're gonna be quiet because I'm gonna be talking, okay? Okay. So on the next slide, we have a circle. And a circle is really important in this process because as we're speaking about equity, um, here you go, go to your dad. Um, as we're speaking about equity, it's really important to recognize where we all are in relationship to each other. And it's also important that we get to know each other. One of the biggest challenges in an equity um, class or in working in equity situations is being able to know each other so that you can have challenging conversations or hard conversations. And so we start this class by um, sharing an identity artifact. We start with the circle because my belief system, my tribal um, belief system really believes in the circle. And all of these points on the circle from the outside of the circle to the inside of the circle are equal. And so everybody on the outside of this circle is equal. They aren't smarter because they're their teacher. They're not um, without knowledge because they're the student. They aren't um, any better for any kind of uh, identity reason, whether they are um, she, her, hers, or him, her, him, his, and his, all of these points are equal. And so at this point, it kind of levels the playing field and hopefully starts out a platform where people can openly share what they know and openly grow what they don't know, if that makes sense. Um, so this is our circle that we started out with our students. And on the very first meeting and coming together, we do this sort of getting to know you session because we know when we dig into these harder pieces and are hoping to do this growing and learning that we need to know each other. So I think that Robert is going to take the next slide and lead us into one of these activities that we do to start really engaging in a conversation. Yes, thank you, Sina. So yeah, let's engage in this exercise that uh, the fellows in our Buell program uh, were able to engage in. And so as you can see on this slide, let's just take a moment um, in wherever space you're at. Oh, and hello, Cassie, how are you? Um, so uh, in your room, you can check your pockets, maybe at your desk, anywhere that's in your space and find an object, find an artifact that you feel um, has a lot of reading, uh, meaning, resonates for you, and share that item with us. So some of the questions to kind of think about when you're looking around for this object you'd like to share, this artifact, you can think about who you are, uh, who am I, what makes me who I am, how do we live our values in our life, um, what stake do we have in our public work uh, when it comes to the organizations that we serve, um, and who are we in our organization? So we can just take a moment to kind of find an artifact. And in fact, I've got one on my person. It can be as grand or as maybe as mundane as, as, you, as you'd like. Um, but so I'm going to share mine first since I have it kind of right on hand. So this actually just a keychain was actually brought to me by one of my team members who had just come back from a visit to Mexico. Um, and that staff person, uh, her name is Karina. And she's just a wonderful member of, of the four staff team that I have the privilege and the honor of being able to uh, work alongside and help guide. And when I think about this artifact and how that relates to me, my identity, my positionality, um, the role I play in my workplace, um, one of the things about the Children's Museum that is absolutely crucial is how we, 
um, in the organization our staff get along with one another. Um, and in order for this museum to function well and to be able to serve the families that come and visit us, it is absolutely crucial that we have teamwork and trust, camaraderie, communication, um, that we have faith uh, in one another. And the way I always kind of term and think about it in my head is, is that when it comes to the staff here at the Children's Museum, we are one another's shepherds and champions. And so when there's a teammate of mine that feels comfortable enough to be able to offer this to me um, as just, I think, something that signifies a level of respect, um, and I would dare say, and I hope she'd feel the same way, uh, friendship. Um, this means a great deal to me. And I really think that it just absolutely reflects um, just how I feel about the staff that I help to uh, tend to um, and what we value in our organization and what I value in my life because I really have just a strong belief in people. I have a strong belief in the team that I'm with and the staff and I have a strong belief in our community. All right, who would like to share their artifact? I can go next. I have um, a package of seeds and these are my artifact today because um, it kind of means a whole bunch of things on a bunch of different levels. So I'm um, Seminole Choctaw and Creek and I believe in a Seminole religion and my big um, ceremony of the year is called green corn. And so I actually have a corn, I don't know if you can see it, tattooed on my arm. And so this is really big to me because it's like our New Year's and it comes with the harvest of the fresh corn. So it's really important to me. Um, corn is a big part of my life and in double fold or however you want to call it. Um, I love gardening and it is a big part of who I am and it is part of something that I share with my family and I share with my kids and I share with my partner. And so it's something that we really, it teaches patience, it teaches follow through, it teaches preparation. You have to prepare the soil, you have to do all of these things. And there's so much learning that happens when you're gardening. And so I just think that these little seeds are so rich and so valuable because they have so much in them outside of just providing sustenance. And then I guess in the third thing program that is really important to me is that I work on food insecurities at Clayton Early Learning in my job. And so we work on all kinds of different ways. So we have like a Clayton market where people can come and shop for free. We also connect gardening opportunities with those families so that they can have strong parent-child relationships as well as food and fresh vegetables in their homes. And so this artifact really hits me on lots of different levels because it looks kind of basic and plain as and it's just the packages of seeds, but I think it contains so much more and it's really um, a part of who I am. Okay, I will go next unless someone else wants to go. Okay, I have a quilt that my mom made me when I was turned 18. She made me this wedding ring quilt. And um, every time we do this experience in class, I share something different and something different kind of comes up for me in terms of why it matters. And for me this last year, I've really been thinking a lot and working closely with Sina, especially and with Robert, but thinking about my heritage of growing up in a family where we still have the sod house that was um, part of in, in the United States free land, free land <laughs> was given and Nebraska, the town I grew up in, um, had a lot of folks come during that point in our history and essentially take this land. And if you built a house on it, it was now your land you know, in quotes, and we still have that house. And, and we still have this whole kind of heritage of being really hardworking pioneer kinds of folks who make something out of nothing. And that quilt that my mom made really represents her heritage. Um, and when you go into that house now, it's filled with quilts that, you know, my ancestors made and so I've just been thinking a lot about that and what the quilt represents for me, the bad parts of it and the good parts of it, and how I bring that identity into my own work as an educator. Who would like to go next? I can go. 
Um, I know you said one thing, but I have two things because they come as a package. And this is artwork and a present that a mother daughter team sent me. So <laughs> I had one year where I had mother in one program and daughter in another program and worked with, got to work with them for an entire year. And they love to do this kind of artwork. It's very similar. I think they sit together oftentimes to do it. And um, I'm heading toward retirement. So I'm on my final sabbatical and it just um, captured for me or put together the things that they took from all the things that we had done together and all the learning. And some of the words are things like richness, having an important impact, questions, uh, curiosity, voice, transformation, relationship. And, um, and so it feels good to know that I'm getting to pass some of this stuff on and that they will pass it on. So I'm kind of into this generational thing lately. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Awesome. Thank you. So welcome, Emilio. Um, we have Judith, who might want to share something in chat, possibly. And we have Cassie. If you are, in, if either of you are interested in sharing, please do. Huh? Yes, sure. I can share something. Um, so this is like a small flower base. I didn't make the place, but I make the mushroom. And for me, like art is such something so important in my life. And because I come from quite like a low income family. So in college, I kind of like abandoned my art hobby and just somehow it still come back. <laughs> you know, it's like kind of like, if you have a gift, you should use this. And now as somebody work in peace and conflict study, I do a lot of research, like art-based research. And when I work with the community, I also do a lot of like, um, use a lot of art-based activities like photo voice or like storytelling. And for me, that's just like an awesome way to connect with the community. And also to, I guess, kind of follow my art passion. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. Were you one of the ones who presented about photo voice yesterday? No, I was not. Uh, there was a there was a presentation and we actually used photo voice in the fall too. We didn't design um, this this research study around it, but yeah, it's a very powerful tool. And we had something from Judith in the chat. Yeah, I'm like, I can read it out too. So let's see, it says, uh, and Judith mentioned on my way out of the house, I decided to take with me a book, a book of ecological virtues living well in the Anthropocene. It speaks of care, love, and humanness without commodifying sustainability. Wow. I'm going to definitely check out that book. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Judith. And then, Emilio, we're just uh, partaking in a fun exercise. That, one, it's one of the things that the program that Rebecca and Sina um, facilitated our uh, the Buell program that I was also a participant in and just as an aspect of just finding an artifact that's nearby you whether it's in your pocket if it's somewhere on your desk in your room anywhere just to share an item um, an object some type of artifact that represents an aspect of who you are okay I am quite sorry because uh, right now I I can't give you all my intention because I'm I'm driving, but I oh, really no. wanted to participate. So uh, maybe that, that that car the car it's something that in some way <laughs> represent uh, right now myself and uh, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, well and uh, and my my relation with education too. Uh, so if you are okay with this, I will be happy to, to listen. I know that it's not it's not the best way to participate in this kind of conference, but I really, I really, I, I am, I'm struggling to at the time to participate in the way that I really would love to do. Quite sorry, guys, sorry, bye. No, not at all. I think it really- uh, I, I'm listening, listening and uh, we when have. I can. Thank you. No apologies are needed at all, Emilio. We are, we are all, I, th I think, I don't want to speak for all of us, but I know for myself, I'm the, doing the same thing, trying to balance so many 
aspects of my life. And um, I'm just glad to have, we're glad to have you here. So uh, thank you. Yeah, definitely. And I think, and I just want to remind folks that learning happens in all kinds of different ways. And so part of sharing the equity artifact is sharing that we are sitting in different spaces with different things on our plates, right? And so how can we come together in this moment to make sure that all of our needs are met and that we're having an open dialogue? So we uh, recognize that some folks are sitting in museums and libraries and cars and that we have different access to technology. So we're just going to make sure that our dialogue is really rich not to worry. And so we're going to move on to this next slide here. So that art, that initial artifact uh, activity was something that kind of helped to position our work throughout the course of the program over the three semesters that comprise the Buell program. And so um, when it came to the culmination of our fall semester, we had the chance to, in this kind of um, aspect of multimodal storytelling, revisited the idea of artifacts. And rather than finding an object or artifact, this exercise entailed fellows in the program creating an artifact, um, an equity artifact that um, allowed students uh, to analyze their own progress through the Buell program and through that course in particular, and uh, allowed them to reflect and think about how they felt they were developing as a leader um, in social justice. Um, us fellows were asked to consider um, what we discovered about ourselves throughout the summertime in the first semester, and going through the fall semester, reflecting on how our thinking and our feeling and our modes of practice changed over time. Uh, we were invited to frame our leadership values through an equity lens, and we were also able to then create uh, personal intentions and social justice agendas as leaders uh, in our context. And so the assignment allowed us to kind of really um, push our thinking and even our kind of creative brains in a very authentic way. Um, and that allowed us to uh, communicate and represent our learning process and just our growth. The slide that you see in front of you here is one that uh, just provides a number of examples of the colleagues that I had uh, in the 13th cohort. So um, this allowed all of us fellows to just kind of really share our journey. Um, and so those equity artifacts, very similar to our room today, where it's a book, it's the car that we're driving in. It's, a, it's, it's the art, it's the, um, is the blanket. Um, these equity artifacts manifested in various different ways. And so for instance, we had one of our fellows, Rosie, who created a, a beautiful sculpture that was made um, with found objects um, and also some things that she was able to piece together. And that kind of reflected her, um, I guess just her thinking and her feelings and her journey through uh, considering things like privilege and power and oppression, but also knowing that in her work that she was able to kind of um, positively impact those kinds of situations and to really bring positivity to the families that she worked with. Um, Kenya, another one of uh, our colleagues, actually generated a poem that you can actually see on the screen here. Um, and that kind of, you know, kind of in her reflecting on her experience uh, as someone who came uh, to the United States from another country um, and just kind of thinking about the impacts of our society and the lives of immigrants. Uh, also too, uh, Natalie actually created a song um, and was able to um, just kind of lyrically kind of share her ideas about the idea of healing and also her feelings and thoughts about leadership. And so um, one of the things too, after we had the opportunity to share our, our equity artifacts with one another was that we had the chance to reflect on those artifacts, um, to think about the things that we noticed and also our wonderings. We we're also able to break into different groups um, identity alike groups in our cohort to really just get the chance to kind of think about um, what emerged for us. What were some of the common commonalities that emerged for us? 
Um, and again, through the through the storytelling that each of us had the chance to be able to present through objects, we were then able to, again, consider our identity, our positionality, um, our role in our work and how we're progressing through our professional journey, our journey through Buell. Um, and so, and it mentions the Ignite 2 uh, that we'll get a chance to visit here in a minute, but then I'll go ahead and hand off to Sina. We'll just kind of both tag team on this. So this slide really right now is really about the process that we've done in this um, research study that looks at the process of those artifacts. And so we decided that we wanted this, the learning experience that the students were having this program to really be in depth so that they were able to look inside themselves and see where they have biases, see where they have privileges, see where they have leverage, see where they have power, see where maybe they don't. And to really, so that they can reframe how they're doing their work out in the world in learning environments, whether that's in with individual families, in classrooms or at policy levels. And so, we wanted to make sure that the um, activities that we were providing in the classroom, such as the um, introduction of artifact, as well as the creation of your artifact from your growth and development, were really providing the opportunities that we were hoping for as teachers for the learners in that classroom. So the study that Robert and Rebecca and I took part in was taking apart those artifacts and looking at what are we noticing what are we noticing in these? What do they, what the observations make us wonder about for these learning experiences? What are the implications for the fellows for their learning? We were really hoping to take um, the, the classroom and, and possibly even flip it on its head so that it's done in a different matter where we're not really focused on timelines and grades, but more about that deep conversation that happens where the learning is really like creating aha moments that change people's practices so that when they're in the community, they're doing great leading. So it really taught us about implications for teaching and learning and how we wanted to approach learning in the whole program. And then as we move forward in the slides here, we took all of those note cards where we um, were able to examine those artifacts and we examined them together as a, individually and then together as a whole. And we really were able to pull out themes and, and wonderings that kind of aligned or maybe some outliers that we were like, wow, here's something that's showing up in students who are students of colors. And here are um, items that are coming up in our uh, students that, um, that are communities that are maybe more white communities. And so we were able to really look at that information and come up with some different diagrams that helped us highlight what is happening in the learners' minds as they're moving through this program. So uh, at this point, we're kind of moving into the fall and just wanna highlight the, the primary text and way of learning in the fall is really building on the idea of dialogue um, coming at us from Paolo Fre Freire. Um, and so just as we kind of set the summer course with the Menicum text, we're doing the same thing in the fall here, but moving into a space of less internal work and now bring, still internal, but adding to it this, uh, the collaborative, the nature of being in conversation and dialogue about our identities and about what they mean for our leadership. And um, that the act of creation starts to become one that's more communal. And so we move into what students do is um, share and ignite after a lot of different sensing experiences, like the photo voice is one of them, appreciative interviews with families is another, um, a literature, a deep literature investigation and a conversation with um, the academic spaces around kind of the questions that they have, then they lead into this Ignite. And um, so Robert, I'll let you share about the Ignite. Yes, absolutely. So as a slide mentions there, um, the Ignite presentations are five minute talks. They consist of a very brief presentation, that five minute window in which presenters get only 20 slides. 
the slides actually advance automatically. And so it's a, a very kind of fast paced and fun way to provide information, but it's also very impactful. And so um, when it comes to uh, this particular assignment that really kind of carries forward um, the things that we're learning in our kind of um, dialogues and um, just, again, a lot of, of what we're learning and investigating in ourselves and being able to kind of uncover and explore and discover, um, us learners were able to reflect on our journey through the program. We were able to encapsulate where we were coming from in terms of who we were before entering Buell, what we learned and perhaps even unlearned, um, how we grew um, up to that point, and then also um, sharing our aspirations for how we wanted to carry our work forward in our respective contexts. And again, similar to what we did with the um, equity artifacts, um, we had the opportunity to be able to um, bring that information together um, and be able to kind of investigate and explore and find themes of that particular work. Um, we also gave the opportunity when it came to the Ignite presentations uh, to have everyone present their presentations. Everyone had the chance to also reflect. And as you can see here, everyone had the chance to individually reflect on those presentations um, to identify what they noticed and also to share what they were wondering about. And we actually then, when it came to capturing that information, had individual faculty support groups and broke down the cohort from there. And that's where there were groupings of fellows along with instructors um, with each of those groups. And we were able to then, with dialogue, share those ideas, reflect, um, really just kind of have the chance to um, kind of disrupt norms in those discussions um, and really delve into, again, how these things relate to our practice, how they relate to us as individuals in terms of our positionality and our contexts um, and how that all relates in our organizations. And I guess we can move to the next slide there. And so, yes, um, oops, yes. Um, so uh, then as we were making our way through into the third and final semester of the Buell program, as you can see on the um, slide here, the focus of the third semester uh, was about leading across. And so I think this is where, you know, it's the kind of culmination of the work we've done with the program and how we leave the program and carry onward. So toward the end of the program, we had the opportunity to share with the cohort a number of considerations and questions to kind of bear in mind and to live with uh, and to carry on and to have those things inform what they do uh, in the future. Um, and those questions are uh, how we address the identities we're born or where they came from with versus the identities that we choose. And then thinking about how those choices that we make along the way uh, serve to shape those the, the aspects of our identities in the past, in the present, and also in the future. Another question we had to consider was, were we seeing any themes across all assignments that we had throughout the semesters? The equity uh, artifact, the Ignite Talks, just all the various different um, readings we had. Um, and could we explore these more with uh, implications with our learning and uh, teaching? We also uh, asked fellows, we were uh, asked to consider implications for teaching and learning both for ourselves and uh, for the program. Um, and that when it comes to the Ignite Artifact and Ignite Talk assignments, do those things live with us in our continued learning beyond the program? Also, how do those assignments influence the work that we're doing when it comes to leading across in our organizations? Um, and then how do we use freedom within the work uh, when it comes to freedom to learn, to grow, to document our experiences and to communicate? Um, so those are just things that we really take into account. And again, the things that we carry with us moving forward in our contests. So yeah, so now we have about 17 minutes left and we're hoping that we can have some rich dialogue. Here are some prompts that we could consider, but these are just suggestions. If you all have other things you wanna talk about or ask us questions about, please um, feel free to do so.
Yes, and then um, for uh, Emilio and uh, Judith may not have the chance to see the screen there. So there are some questions here that we have that you can think of. And again, like Rebecca mentioned, um, these are just kind of a nice prompts to kind of jump in. But uh, when it comes to questions, you know, are you seeing uh, any connection between what we've shared today and your particular practice? Um, from our approach, what might you consider including in your own context, the organization that you're with, um, and maybe also to maybe aspects of your personal life? Um, what additional ideas and wonderings do you have about opening uh, learning spaces and professional environments to more storytelling and multimodal experiences? And how may these dialogic and creative processes open the door to decolonized inclusive spaces that promote making meaning together? And so sometimes in our courses, you know, when we have the opportunity to share prompts, you know, um, we are not at all um, uncomfortable with there being a little bit of that kind of silence that gives a chance for people to kind of think and consider. Um, and so that's also kind of one of the things in terms of the kind of dialogic practices that we had that it is that kind of sense of discomfort, not only in just the things that we discussed, but also kind of understanding that in these virtual spaces, they're not the same as being in a, a physical setting. Um, and so, yeah, again, we have some good time in front of us for the dialogue. I'll start if that's okay. Um, I really appreciate the description of your program. The three of you do a nice um, cooperative job of presenting and um, I like the assignments and the ways in which <clears throat> artifacts and other kinds of things are incorporated into the ways in which people would express themselves. My question I think is a hard question only because this is where things seem to break down in the classroom, in the workplaces and practicum sites um, for many of us. And it is in the dialogic spaces. So people have these experiences, they learn about these things, they learn more about themselves. But <clears throat> can you talk more about how people actually have decolonized their language and their conversations with one another or how you help to promote that because that's usually the place of breakdown, at least in my experience. So we know about, but when it comes to doing, I don't know if old things kick in or what the problem is, but conversations break down. So here they break down and then how do we get them on on track again? Great question. I think that you are right that that it all sounds really pretty and easy, right? But then when it comes down to doing it, a lot of times we revert back to what might be habit or like a trained lens of how you look things, look at things and interact with the world. And we are really focused and intentional in this course at providing um, sort of two ways of making it happen. And so one way is by creating some safe spaces that um, people with like identities can come and process that information. So um, we provide a like identity groups. So like a, a, a person of colors group and maybe a, a, a non-person of colors group. And so then those people can go into th those groups where they self-identify and process what they are hearing. The Manicum book is really talks about um, the trauma and how we internalize it in our bodies. And I think a lot of times we are moving in such a fast paced society that we don't slow down to think about how we're internalizing what we're experiencing at the grocery store or at our job or in our last supervision with our boss or in this exchange with the uh -huh. student that didn't go how you wanted to or internalizing all of those good things that are happening in, in those same spaces. And we just sort of shift and move through to the next thing. This class that we engage with really requires students to take the time to slow down and to think about those and figure out how you're gonna process. It. Where in my body am I storing that pain? And how am I exerting that pain without myself even knowing it? So we are asking them to take time to stop and look at their biases and their privilege. 
And so that's what's happening. We look at our, ourselves and we're providing this safe space for processing and dialogue. And then on the other side, we are offering a lot of opportunity for dialogue across lines. And for dialogue across lines that say, hey, this is my frame of reference and my view and my experience. And it might not align with yours and where can we grow, right? So experiences for people to say, oh, wow, I didn't realize that I say this word and, and don't really think about how it affects other people. Or I never realized how policies and procedures are affecting schools and programs because I didn't have that experience. And so we're trying to provide lots of space for dialogue so that people can say, whoops, I've made a mistake or, hey, look at me, I'm growing and I've learned something new. Because I think that when we're in our everyday lives in our work, places or in our school places, we don't have that opportunity to make those mistakes and to show that growth, right? We expect people to be firm, steady in their one belief and to have that initial belief be the right belief. And this class really talks about taking the time to slow down and move forward. And that's why the initial artifact is about where you kind of are starting and, and who makes you who, what. And then you create an artifact that talks about your growth in that internal class. And then the next class is working with others. And so then you have to figure out how to shift from that internal growth and take that growth and work with the others and create the Ignite experience. And Sina, I would, I would add as well, and the reason I put this slide up is because we do some intentional teaching around the kinds of things that are part of our education system that are coming from either a white supremacy stance or a white or a Christian supremacy stance. And, and an example of that is that we do have this visual that we use around the circle. And it's so awesome to be able to teach with someone like Sina who can help me learn about ways of decolonizing. But um, in this case, instead of doing a, a traditional clockwise way of going around this circle or the way that we might in a, in a more uh, a white or a Western perspective think about a circle, Sina teaches us different ways. And I don't wanna speak for you, Sina, if you wanna talk about that as an example. Yeah, um, just one of the opportunities to do something different is that in my culture, we um, kind of do a counterclockwise um, mode of operation in like our ceremonial dances and how we do things. And so um, one of the things that is often overlooked is time and, and how people learn. And a lot of times we, in a Western world, we'll learn in a linear fashion or like in a, in a right facing mo forward movement. And in some communities, that's not how it happens. And so this can be a perfect example of how instead of going like a clock would turn time on this count on this circle, we're going to reverse that and we're going to try to have people challenge the way their brain is kind of already internally wired to move and to move the opposite direction so that they can start in little pieces seeing, oh, wow. My, I've been trained to think like this and maybe the whole world doesn't look at a clock that way. So that when you're providing services, for example, and you're going into a, a family's home and doing some home-based services, maybe they don't have a table because maybe they eat on the floor and in their culture, in their community, that's what's regular, right? And so it's retraining some of these pieces that your brain and the society has sort of uh, institutionalized in our processes and helping them to think, oh, wow, this can be done differently. Yeah, and I would also like to add too that I think when it comes to certain fellows that um, I was able to be in the program with, I think it was really important that we acknowledge some of those tensions that exist. Um, and kind of being in that certain space, I think allows for that discussion to occur. So that way people can confront in themselves some of those things. and and take into account that, you know, these are certain ideas and norms and mores that have been kind of instilled into one over time. Um, and I think it's one of those things too, where for me, it's, it was important for us to know that even though these are some of those aspects um, that are living within us um, in terms of our positionality, that, you know, even, it's, even though it is something that may require a redress um, or even mm -hmm. correction to not feel a sense of shame about that. Um, because again, it's about growth. 
and it's about exploration and it's about again it's about leading across it's about growing as a leader and realizing that in order to do so is to be able to just kind of to be brave and to be able to to confront and to challenge um, and to and to transcend <clears throat> Thank you. I'll just add one small, again, teaching strategy related to that. And it's to not, the small group spaces, the very deep intentionality around dyads, groups of three, smaller groups of like six, a whole group, and when you're having different conversations, but also having a non synchronous space as well. So we do a lot of like Google Docs and other documents, Padlets, that kind of thing to add where folks can process and have a little more time to think about what they wanna say and share. And there can be dialogue on those documents that's asynchronous to allow folks to really, um, to go deeper and to maybe feel safer as well. Any other one we have? Okay, so we've got five minutes left. We can stay in whole group dialogue if that's helpful for everyone. The other thing we have designed, if you want a moment of self-reflection to think about what this means for you, we, we often offer this in our courses, time to reflect with a prompt individually or to engage in a shared Padlet, which I will actually put this in the chat. Um, oopsie. And then if you decide that you would like to add to it later, if you're not familiar with the Padlet here, I'll pull it up real quick. It's just a space where you can go in and you just use the um, a little plus here down here in the corner plus to add something. You can add a comment, an image, a link, a video, music, uh, lots of different possibilities for adding. So I'll put that link in the chat and you all can let us know where you wanna go next. It looks like Judith had Oh, good, Sina. Thank you for monitoring chat. I'm trying to do my best. <laughs> and Judith's question was uh, about um, in in teaching how to the, to get her students to go from a banking education system to a different process. And so we were talking about um, naming those systems and starting by small, simple examples so that um, they can see where maybe they are participating in things that they're overlooking as a banking method of, of a way of living. And then start really outlining and naming ways of doing things differently. I think that a lot of time, like when we're working with small children, we say, use your words, but we don't realize that they don't have the words, right? They don't know I'm frustrated or that hurts my feelings because. And so a lot of that beginning teaching with those students is saying, this is an example of a banking model. This is an example of doing things different. And these are words in, in language that go with that change, that shift of thinking. And so we, go into communities and schools and do this work without recognizing that people don't have the words. We're lucky that a lot of us work in academia. And so we have access to, um, to, to bigger, you know, word range and in the common world and stuff like that, where people aren't in these higher level conversations, they might not have the words that are talking about intersectionality or words that are, are these other um, decolonization and stuff like that. So we need to take the time to slow down and give them the words so that when we're asking them to shift their brains and thinking, they have the tools. And that's my last thought. 